Good afternoon. I'm Adrian Dix, uh, BC Minister of Health. Beside me is Dr. Bonnie Henry, the Provincial Health Officer for British Columbia. I want to thank uh, members of the media for their cooperation today in uh, ensuring appropriate distancing here at the media conference, at the media event. Uh, we'll be, we'll uh, be briefing here tomorrow uh, at the Vancouver Cabinet offices at 3 o'clock and on Friday. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry for today's report on COVID-19. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, so these are extraordinary times, as we know, and there's been many changes even overnight um, in the status uh, both around the world and here in British Columbia. So today we have uh, 45 new cases uh, to report. So that brings our total of uh, cases that have been tested uh, positive here in British Columbia to 231. Um, that includes 144 in Vancouver Coastal Health, 58 in the Fraser Health Region, 16 on Vancouver Island, 9 in the Interior Health Region, and 4 in Northern Health, uh, including uh, one is a resident of a new uh, long-term care home, um, the Harrow Park Centre in Vancouver Coastal Health. We now have 13 people who are hospitalized, seven of whom are in intensive care here in British Columbia. Uh, five continue to be recovered, and we have no new deaths to report. So, as I said, these are extraordinary times, and we took a number of extraordinary measures in the last uh, few days to try and do everything that we can to try and stop the transmission of this uh, virus in our communities and flatten out the curve over the next seven to ten days is the critical time. It's sometimes challenging to see what it is today um, when we seem like everything's fine. But we do know that this virus is spreading in our community. And the measures that we are uh, requiring and asking of people are to try and prevent as much of that spread as we can and slow it down as much as we can and protect those people who are most likely to have severe illness from this disease, particularly our seniors and elders, people with uh, compromised immune systems, people with underlying uh, illnesses. So as you know, uh, we issued some orders under the Public Health Act in the last, um, in the last couple of days around schools, around uh, pubs, bars and nightclubs and restrictions in restaurants, around travel and on mass gatherings in the community. These are temporary, but they are extremely important right now. Yesterday I talked a bit about, you know, we're dealing today with things that happened 10 days, 14 days ago. And what we do today is going to help us in the next 10 days, 14 days, two weeks or three weeks. And it's incredibly important that people start paying attention and use these measures now to mitigate what is happening in our communities now. Having said that, orders, so legal orders, are really an order, a measure of last resort. And mostly, we're asking people to take voluntary steps to help us in our community. And while they are voluntary, there is an expectation that we will do our civic duty to do our best around this, to proactively protect our communities and our families and our communities. So just to make clear what some of this is, and I know there's been a lot of questions about what exactly these mean in different settings. So around businesses, the orders that we have really are about making sure that we have those appropriate measures in place so that essential businesses keep going. We don't lose the essential services that we need in our communities. Everything from the lights and, and Wi-Fi for sure, <laughs> um, things like our transportation, our public transportation net networks, our essential goods and people movement around our province and our country and internationally. So for businesses, for example, um, grocery stores or pharmacies, it'll vary by the business how you will need to implement these measures. So that may mean, that will mean enhanced cleaning both in your premise but also for um, people who are employees of the premise so they can clean their hands frequently, they can clean the surfaces around them and they're able to have um, in clean, enhanced cleaning in all parts of the, of the business. 
but it can be ta tailored to your business. So for some people, the social distancing requirements, making sure that there's at least one to two meters around people in your business. If you're a grocery store that's a very large one, that may mean that you can accommodate several hundred people without them having to come in close contact with each other. If it's a very small business, it may have to be one at a time or, or uh, very few people. So those are things that can be determined by your own business given your own circumstances. We also have uh, been asked a lot of questions about other um, sites like industrial sites. And again, these are, these are less risky environments for many parts, even though you may have a lot of people there. So employers should be looking at reducing the numbers on a site if possible, making sure that employees are not congregating in areas where they're spending a lot of time together, for example, at lunches and breaks, that they have opportunities when they're in enclosed spaces to separate from each other and you can have staggered schedules, for example. But for most industrial sites, um, this is not a difficult accommodation and it's something that employers should pay attention to. In terms of public transportation, this is an essential service for many people for getting back and forth to work, for healthcare workers, for other essential services workers. But there are things we can do in our transportation systems that will help us to minimize the distance of the, the contact between people and help prevent transmission. So things like minimizing the number of people on cars or regulating the number of people in a, in a bus so that they can sit um, separate from each other, putting barriers in place for employees like bus drivers. Many of the buses now have some barriers so that people aren't um, able to breathe directly. Um, making sure you've enhanced cleaning in those facilities and on those services and that the employers, employees of the of the, of the um, transportation services are able to clean their hands regularly and clean their space around them. So one of the other issues that we've been working on over the last little while is about child care services. And child care services and daycares must be provided in a safe manner for those families where parents work in our essential services sector. And we uh, have not recommended blanket closing of child care services because they are essential services for our um, parents that work in our essential services as well. However, as we implement these broad social measures to delay transmission of COVID-19, many parents now are working from home and caring for their children at home. And that is really important because that does take the pressure off our daycare centers and ensures that there is reliable and safe childcare for those who do need it. So this will help our child care, our daycare centers implement a more rigorous approach to things like hand hygiene, food handling, food services, so that smaller groups of children can be in a more appropriate environments in sometimes. Um, when we're looking at many different ways that that can happen. Um, using enhanced cleaning measures, um, things like symptom checks, things like reducing the, the, um, the uh, um, crowding together of people during um, drop-offs and pickups of children, so staggering schedules, um, making sure that uh, staff are uh, um, able to protect themselves as well. So these are all uh, measures that we'll be looking at and then reviewed and guidance will be coming in the coming days. And our ministries will be providing more specific guidelines for preventing the spread of COVID-19 in childcare facilities to the owners and licensing officers in the coming days to make sure that we continue to have safe and reliable access to essential childcare during this very difficult time. I do want to mention a few other things. Uh, one is around employers and doctor's notes. And we have said this before, but we'll repeat. Really, there's no need for doctor's notes, particularly in this um, situation that we are in, and that uses up much needed healthcare services. So uh, we are, again, appealing to employers not to require doctor's notes, and of course, not to require testing for this for employees to return to work. So this is a challenging time where we need to really think about taking care of each other, taking care of our communities and our families because it will be a changing situation over the next few weeks. We may see many other things that are happening. And as I mentioned, what we are doing now is to protect us for the next few weeks. The things that we need to do today are to clean our hands regularly, not touch our face and mouth, 
covering our mouth when we cough. Social distancing is now a very important part of all of our communities across British Columbia. And of course, staying home if you are sick or if you are somebody who is at high risk for this disease. And I'm calling upon all of us in our communities to support people so they don't have to go out if they're at risk or if they're in isolation for reasons that uh, of risk for this disease. I will mention as well that uh, the Canadian Blood Services has indicated that we have an urgent need for blood donations here in British Columbia and that they are establishing services so that people can donate blood in a very safe way. And so if you are um, want to donate blood and want to be able to contribute to that, you can go to blood.ca and there will be information about how you can do that. And so again, I talked about yesterday the, the importance of, of coming together as a community right now and I will implore all of you to be kind. Um, to be calm and to be safe, and we will get through the next few weeks together. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Henry. Um, as Dr. Henry has reported, uh, our total number of cases in British Columbia is 231. I mean, with 45 identified since yesterday. That represents 144 cases in the Vancouver Coastal Health Authority. 58 in the Fraser Health Authority, 16 in Island Health, 9 in Interior Health, and 4 in the Northern Health Authority. Uh, most of that, those uh, patients, most of them, are resting at home in self-isolation, stable, and we hope, of course, getting better with the support of public health. We now have 13 patients in acute care. We had seven yesterday. And of these 237 cases, I believe it's still the case that five have recovered, meaning they've had two consecutive negative tests. Our testing continues. There's a lot of interest in the amount of testing that's done. As you know, we provide precise numbers every Friday. The reason for that is that we, w it's not, we want our people doing the work and not reporting on the work all the time. And we now have multiple locations, five locations around uh, the province that actually do the physical tests, that run the tests. Of course, many, many more that are, uh, that are collecting the tests around the province. We estimate that at least 17,000 people have been tested and we'll have precise numbers on Friday. But that gives you a sense. If you think back at the n amount of testing that's been done when we had our uh, presentation, I believe, on February 28th, we had done, I think, the most at that time and it was about 1,000 uh, British Columbians have been tested uh, at that time, focusing, of course, on travel at the time. Then the following week, which was uh, approximately March 6th, I think, it was 2,000. And uh, last Friday, it was 6,225. The number that uh, you're going to get received this Friday indicates the growing intensity of testing. And while our, intense, uh, our testing has become more strategic, we are doing more and more of it, and more and more of it is necessary. I want to underscore that uh, whether it's those who have recovered, those who have died, or those who have tested positive, their families, loved ones, friends, and neighbors, th those are the people that we have in our mind's eye and others who are facing this struggle, who we have in our mind's eye when we, when we address these problems as a community. And we should all have them and all remember people, as Dr. Henry has said, who are especially vulnerable, in particular. Uh, seniors and our elders, those living in care homes, and that requires specific steps, but also people with chronic diseases, people living uh, with disabilities, particularly adults living with disabilities in our society, and many, many more. Um, I think what Dr. Henry said that is so important is that under these circumstances we have to continue to be calm, continue to be safe, continue to be generous with one another. I want to note uh, a couple of other uh, points here that are important in terms of information to you, that just to give you a sense of where we are. Our, um, our uh, self-assessment tool, which is on the BCCDC website, had at the end of yesterday 774,618 total users. That number is now, as I am told, close to a million as of right now. I want to emphasize what Dr. Henry said with respect to the blood supply and the need for people to give blood and there will be information out to the public and this is one way that we can participate, those of us who uh, do not need to be staying at home at the moment in supporting one another. I note um, there's a, in the South Asian community there's a, 
uh, community of people around the Sikh community that gives blood all the time, that has, uh, that is making a call out to the community for more blood donations there. We thank them and we need uh, more people to join them. Uh, I, I wanted to note a couple other things again. Uh, our new 1-800-COVID-19 line, uh, the calls answered yesterday was 1,807. That has relieved some of the pressure on our um, on our 811 line, which is continuing to answer between three and 4,000 calls a day. Um, finally, a couple of things uh, about uh, the actions that have been taken and the actions that will be taken to address this as a community. We have asked, and the provincial health officer has asked, and all of us have asked that everyone take part in the efforts uh, to uh, stop the spread of COVID-19 in British Columbia. And some of the actions that have taken place, if we th thought of these things a month ago or two months ago, are truly breathtaking. We've asked people not to travel outside of Canada. We've asked people if they travel outside Canada and return to self-isolate for 14 days. Mass gatherings have been reduced to 50. We've seen uh, decisions made cancelling school classes and the closure of bars and restaurants, the limitation of restaurants uh, around social licensing and so on. And municipalities and other levels of government have taken actions on, in their own right. And all of these are dramatic. And what, uh, uh, of course, and we wouldn't have imagined taking them months, a month ago or two months ago. But I think what I wanted to emphasize is, because there's always discussion about who's following and who isn't. First of all, I think an overwhelming majority of uh, people in BC are listening to this advice, because they know what it means for everyone else in their neighborhood and their community. And to those who have been reluctant or who have an occasion not followed the advice, I want to say that your neighbors and your friends and your families are counting on you to do just that. This next two weeks, what we do in this two weeks, every one of us, is important. There's a difference between self-isolation self and isolating yourself from the responsible action we all need to take together. So for today, today I would say for anyone who hasn't joined in this effort, who has been reluctant to join in these very explicit measures we can do to help one another, to, to help protect one another's health, I say it's not too late to join the fight. It's not too late to join the fight. We are asking you to take part today, to, to take your civic responsibility, but your responsibility and our responsibility as human beings to one another. We need you to join in, and we need you to do it now, today, this moment, without judgment, but we need everyone to take part in, what, in, the, in I think, what has been an inspiring call to action from Dr. Bonnie Henry and many others around the country. So, as we've understood from the beginning, it's clear every day we are all in this together. We are all in this together. We count on each other to take the appropriate precautions to keep one another safe. COVID-19 is, is a challenge for us all. And as each day brings news of our shared battle, of our shared obligation, of our shared obligation to one another, and of the seriousness of the fight we're in, we're learning what to do. We're learning how to adapt and we're learning how much we mean to one another. Every single person watching and every single person in this room and all of the other rooms in BC. If that shared experience, that shared responsibility that has to continue to drive us. Thank you very much. We look forward to taking your questions. Thank you, Minister Dix. And before we start taking questions, a gentle reminder to the media that we will be taking only one question from each reporter. We will start with uh, questions from the room. My colleague, Johan, will come around with the microphone. Please do speak into the microphone for the benefit of the media who are listening in. Uh, and uh, for media on the phone, please do press star one if you want to queue up for questions. We'll begin here. Frank. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Henry. Uh, we have seen other jurisdictions uh, like in Asia, in China, that uh, WHO as well uh, recommending uh, when there was a community epidemic, uh, people wear a mask. Uh, but we didn't see that uh, encouragement here. Uh, we didn't see uh, even in the hospital that uh, our caregivers and the health workers are gearing up uh, to protect themselves wearing goggles or masks. Uh, why is that? And uh, there are also uh, Chinese com community groups want to donate uh, and import and donate production gear to our healthcare system. And what can they do to make sure that 
uh, what they donate are up to the standard here? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. So we continue to um, recommend masks for people who have symptoms, and both in the community for people who have symptoms, if they need to go out, for example, to get medical care, a mask is important because it keeps your droplets in. Uh, I will say a mask needs to be worn over one's mouth and nose to, <laughs> to be effective as well. Um, we are using appropriate personal protective equipment like masks, like respirators, eye protection, gloves, gowns in our healthcare settings. And particularly where there are outbreaks, where there's known transmission in that setting. And it's incredibly important to make sure that healthcare workers are protected. And there's pr protocols in place in all of our facilities to ensure that if somebody comes in who's ill, they have a mask put on them and that the healthcare workers wear the important protection that they have a need. In terms of, um, uh, you know, we have uh, received a shipment of respirators and we have more on order. We're working with the federal government to ensure everybody in Canada has what they need. And also we heard today that uh, manufacturers have been um, asked by the federal government or directed by the federal government to ensure that we have what we need. If we do um, get, uh, we, can, we can get the connections for you later for who um, to talk to with respect to bringing in equipment. It was something that we did, uh, the Government of Canada did when uh, we were repatriating Canadians from Wuhan and there was a donation of equipment to support their effort. So I'm sure they would be willing to, to receive that should we need it in the future. Next question, Valerie. C'est pour, pour M. Dix, une petite question en français. Euh, vous avez dit tout à l'heure, euh, il n'est pas trop tard, euh, vous avez lancé un appel aux Britanno-Colombiens en disant, il n'est pas trop tard pour euh, vous joindre à la bataille. Pourtant, la Colombie-Britannique, elle, on, on a l'impression qu'elle a joint la bataille un peu tard, dans la mesure où euh, il y a des provinces où il n'y a pas de décès, où il y avait moins de cas et qui ont, déjà, qui avaient, qui ont déclaré bien avant l'état d'urgence sanitaire et l'état d'urgence. Est-ce euh, que la Colombie-Britannique a agi rapidement? Écoutez, on a, on a décidé d'agir d'urgence il y a neuf semaines, n'est-ce pas? C'est euh, ce en ce moment-là qu'on a établi notre, que notre action d'urgence dans la province. On a mené tout le, tout le pays en, en faisant des tests. Ça, c'est évident. Et l'évidence est, est là. Et notre effort était à fond dès le commencement. Bien entendu, il y a des nouvelles euh, euh, mesures euh, prises au fur et à mesure qu'on qu'on qu passe des jours maintenant et un peu partout. En, en, sur la question d'appel d'urgence, euh, nous sommes dans un état d'urgence depuis euh, quelques semaines. Il fallait, euh, il fallait euh, mettre en place ces mesures parce qu'il y, y avait des choses à faire particulières. Mais il y a un état, euh, état d'urgence dans le système de santé depuis neuf semaines ici en Colombie-Britannique. On fait ce travail chaque jour. Aujourd'hui, il faut dire, parce que j'ai pas fait une, une petite déclaration en français, que, euh, que nous avons 45 nouveaux cas de COVID-19 ici en Colombie-Britannique pour un total de 200 31 cas dans la province. Parmi les nouveaux cas, 13 sont actuellement hospitalisés. Il faut dire sur les chiffres qu'il faut euh, euh, le comprendre dans, dans un contexte. La situation la plus sérieuse dans la province, on le sait, c'est au Lynn Valley Care Center. Et c'est en ce moment, ces moments-là où la situation est rendue difficile quand il s'agit d'un centre de soins dans la province. On a vu dans d'autres euh, pays, euh, que ce soit en Chine ou, euh, ou en Italie ou même à l'état de Washington, ce qui se passe quand quelque chose comme ça arrive dans un centre de soins pour des personnes de troisième âge en particulier. Donc, il faut agir là-dessus. Là Mais la question en, dans la province, nous avons les cas qu'on a. On a fait des présentations chaque jour pour que tout le monde sache la situation actuelle sans ambiguïté. Et je pense que c'est notre style, ça continue à être notre style. Et je pense qu'on a agi premier, mais il faut quand même que tout le monde agisse ensemble, n'est-ce pas? Parce que ce n'est pas une bataille individuelle, ce n'est pas une bataille du système, ce n'est pas une bataille du gouvernement, c'est une bataille de tout le peuple, y compris le gouvernement, mais tous les individus là-bas qui doivent participer si on va réussir. Next question, Ahmad, and then Marcella. This question is for the minister, um, and I'm over here. Um, 
So the last week, maybe even a little bit less than that, the Canadians around the world have heard uh, the advice and the direction of um, both their provinces and uh, the, the country as a whole to come back to Canada. Uh, and we have been hearing from those who uh, have been away for more than six months or a year or two who are no longer eligible for our MSP system. And when they do come back, they fear that the, the two and a half or three month waiting period would put them at risk for uh, being here but not being uh, medically covered. I uh, just wanted to know if uh, you have looked into or will uh, taking care of them by waiving that uh, three month uh, MSP period. Yeah, the Medical Services Commission is meeting this afternoon and uh, it's my strong expectation uh, that that decision will be made at that time. So yes, when people return, they've been called to return. And so those sorts of um, uh, limitations, the three-month waiting period, which has its purpose in normal times, doesn't have it serve that purpose now. And so those actions are being taken. And you'll hear, hear the details of that from the Commission this afternoon. Marcello? Thank you. Just to ask uh, Dr. Henry, what are you doing for cancer patients who no longer have volunteers that can drive them to their appointments to get their treatments? Uh, um, there's a number of different ways that we're trying to support all um, people who have urgent health care needs. And uh, the, the volunteers is one aspect of it. There's other ways that um, people are being supported. I don't know specifically what the BC Cancer is doing, but I know that they have programs in place to address these issues. Yes, we are absolutely. There's some key areas of our healthcare system that we are trying to protect, and certainly cancer care is one of them. And the, cancer, the BC Cancer Agency has a plan for ensuring that we do extraordinary um, protections so that people are safe in that environment and get the, the cancer treatment they need. Yeah, and just, uh, just on that note, um, we've had. Uh, we've had this uh, self-assessment tool which has received this extraordinary response so far and part of the extraordinary response and comments are requests for people to get involved, people who uh, are uh, not in self-isolation, who want to support their community and we're going to be taking steps to encourage that because obviously some people who are the heart of our health care system, our volunteers and our auxiliaries, our foundations are affected by the very consideration so that situation you've talked about. The other thing I'd say is this that um, and, and it's important when we reflect on the decisions we're making that there's the health of everyone related to COVID-19 and then there's the health of everyone in general and all the other challenges we're facing from cancer to diabetes to, uh, to, all, to, to all the others, to Parkinson's disease, to all the other challenges we're facing. And these are very ch difficult qu uh, questions. So when we make decisions, when the provincial health officer makes decisions, we understand those decisions could have consequences for other people and that they have to be balanced in that context. Um, I, we spoke earlier in this week about the cancellation of elective surgeries. And look, I know what it means because I talk to people all the time on wait lists. And this is an important consideration, people waiting in pain. That's health care too. That's people's health too. And so when these decisions are made, when all these decisions are made, and people often suggest, well, you should do this and you should do that, we have to make decisions more quickly in this context, and the provincial health officer has consistently done that. But we also have to consider the evidence and the health of the whole population and what it means for people with cancer and for people dealing, who have other, um, other concerns, and for seniors and for others a lot of the encouragement of public policy is for people to come out of the home and to participate in society. And so we, we want transportation, we want other things. So we get out and we engage with one another, which can sometimes be a challenge for us when we get older and our community of friends changes uh, as, as it does. So these are very challenging things. So when the provincial health officer says, everyone coming back from a trip outside of, of Canada needs to self-isolate for 14 days. You have to self-isolate for 14 days for yourself, for your mom, for your dad, for your kids, for everybody. When we say if you're sick, don't go to work and to stay home and get well, it's for all of those people. These are health-based decisions made for everybody's health. But the question you ask is an example of the implications that we are aware of every day. And I know, because I talk to Dr. Henry many times a day, are foremost in her mind when she makes those decisions. Thank you. Next question, Michelle, then CTV and Ming Pao. This is for the doctor. Um, family of residents of Lynn Valley Care Homes say there is not enough staff and the needs of the seniors there aren't being met and they're giving specific examples. Um, soil diapers not being changed, um, urine bags not being changed at night. Um, 
bedridden seniors not being turned. They say there simply is not enough staff there. Is that a concern to you and are the staffing levels going to be brought up there? It is absolutely a concern to me and it has been since um, we've understood what was going on at Lynn Valley and you know it, uh, it it's such a challenge because we know that people in there are less able to do some of those things themselves and it has been a tremendous challenge for the staff in that area as well. We know that there's a, a, a dozens of um, or at least a little over a dozen staff members who are ill themselves. So um, yes, uh, they are doing everything they can and I, I really support the staff that are in there and they're trying their best. Uh, the challenge is always balancing, um, trying to bring some of the ways that we can keep residents separate and um, prevent transmission which causes further isolation and challenges in providing that care. And I know Vancouver Coastal has been in there every day um, and continues to be in there every day to, to support the team as much as possible. Thank you. City TV? Yeah, um, just further to the uh, hospital um, staff. Um, we've had reports that uh, they're not fully, sta uh, fully uh, resourced with masks and goggles and things like that. And as Frank was saying, there's um, some community members coming to uh, donate items. Are the hospital staff fully protected? Do they have all the resources they need? At this moment, and we've been working for a number of weeks, we've talked to you about our logistics team provincially managing the supply chain. We right now are good. We have what we need in the healthcare facility. Um, workers are, are always um, ad, um, assessing what they need for each patient encounter. And the appropriate PPE we know right now is available and we're doing everything we can to make sure that we continue to have supply as things change in the coming months. Thank you. Next question, Ming Bao. Uh, this question is for Dr. Harry. So it showed in Wuhan and Italy that people uh, got infected but showed no symptom, still can infect others and uh, transmit the virus in the public place. What's your comment on it? So uh, again, there's, there's reports that we see around some unusual events. But the vast majority of transmission of this virus in, in Wuhan, in Italy, in Spain, everywhere that we've seen it is from people who have symptoms being in close contact with others. So we need to focus on that and then ensure that if there's those rare occasions where there is transmission in a, in a family or in a cluster from somebody who has very mild or no symptoms that we're able to identify that. So that's part of our consideration but the very important thing is to make sure that anybody who is sick is uh, away from others. And that's why we do measures like requiring everybody who's traveled internationally um, outside of Canada to self-isolate because even early on they may not recognize they have symptoms, they may have very mild symptoms and we want them to be by themselves so they are no longer transmitting to others. As we've talked about before, we don't have anything to interrupt the transmission once somebody's been exposed. If you've been exposed, I can't give you a vaccine or a medication to prevent you from getting ill. So that's why we have to take these sometimes draconian measures of making everybody stay away when you've been exposed because there's a period of time where you may become ill and if you do, we don't want you to be around anybody else where you can pass it on. So the measures that we're taking are designed to get people before they show symptoms and make sure that they're, they're in isolation themselves so they don't pass it on to others. Thank you and we'll take one last question from the room before we go to the phone. It's uh, Tina with APTN. Yes, good afternoon. Are there any plans to offer um, opportunities for remote communities to conduct their own testing, in particular for Indigenous communities? So I know we've been working very closely with the First Nations Health Authority in particular and the communities around the First Nations communities and also Indigenous communities. So uh, there are many measures that we're trying to take in those communities. We recognize that, um, that in particular um, elders 
are very important. They're the keepers of the knowledge of communities, and we need to do um, everything we can to protect them in First Nations communities. And so the testing strategies, the access to testing, the access to what people need to isolate and plans um, in case somebody becomes, introduces it into a community, unintentionally of course, um, that we have a, a course of action for every community to, to meet those needs. Um, it's, there's challenges, as we all know, and I know that uh, we're actively working with First Nations Health Authority, with communities, with chiefs, and we'll be meeting, I, I believe it's tomorrow or, or Friday morning, with uh, chiefs from across the province and, and with uh, my deputy, um, Dr. Uh, Danielle Bain smith to make sure that we are addressing these in the appropriate way and a culturally appropriate way. If I may just... Uh it's, it's what we've said before, but it bears repeating from the beginning when we set up uh, our emergency response chaired by Dr. Henry and Steve Brown, who's the Deputy Minister of Health. Uh, from the beginning, at every meeting, the First Nations Health Authority is present, involved, in, engaged, has its own plan, and is putting forward in support of our general plan. So uh, there's, at every meeting, uh, there isn't a meeting of, uh, of the leadership of our response that doesn't include the First Nations Health Authority. And I think it's important to recognize that role. I think uh, you want to recognize the territory of the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the Tsleil-Waututh as well uh, that we're responding on today. And just say, uh, Dr. Henry and myself, uh, Dr. Rain Smith and others will be meeting with, uh, by conference call, which is how we're meeting people in large numbers these days, uh, I believe on Friday. And we're going to hold, we hold similar meetings with other, with other communities, but this is obviously a very important one to ensure that um, both the, the voice of First Nations and First Nations government around the province is heard in our response to something that affects everyone in the province, including First Nations. Thank you. We'll go over to the phones now, and we'll take questions from Graham, Mandy, and then Keith. Graham, go ahead, please. Oh, hi, Bongi and uh, Adrian. Um, Obviously, I'd like to know more about the uh, testing capacities at this moment and where they will get to uh, in the foreseeable future. But um, in the absence of a vaccine, uh, do you, in Bongi, do you envision us being able to get back to previously normal life? Um, is, is there a way to get there sooner than later? And can you elaborate? Um, that is a that is a question. You know, we've watched this evolve, and um, I think many of us had hope that uh, the measures that China did would do more than just buy us time. And I've talked about you know the extreme measures they took to try and contain this and to get it back into nature. It's shown that that's not happened, and it's now transmitted around the world as we know. So uh, there are a couple of things. One is uh, the, the measures that we're taking right now. These I, I call them a firewall, the social distancing measures, the mitigation piece that's added to our containment piece is to try and, and separate us enough so that we can stop that and slow it down, the transmission in our communities, in our province, in our country, and get us through the next few weeks to months. The one thing we might see, and I have some glimmers of hope, but well, we won't know until we get there, is that as the weather changes and other respiratory viruses uh, fade away, including the other coronaviruses that we sometimes see, that this one will follow that pattern as well. And it has to do with humidity and temperature and UV light and things like that. So that's one thing we're hoping for. And that will give us a reprieve. But that means it might come back again the next respiratory season. We've also seen with other, um, you know, like the pandemic of influenza, like other uh, coronaviruses, often the first wave and the second wave, the first year or so of the circulation of the virus, it can be more severe. And then when we have a level of population immunity, that can help us. Whether we'll achieve that in the first year, it's probably unlikely. So <laughs> this is a long way of saying um, it's, it's unclear when we'll be back to normal. I do believe that if we do everything we can right now, we will find a period of time where we can start getting back to um, our, our life in a, in a different way, start being socially connected. I think, we will, I think we will fundamentally change some of the ways we're doing things until we have a vaccine, until we have an effective treatment for this. And we need to start using the time in between to prepare for next influenza or next respiratory virus season. 
Um, but I, I am optimistic that if we do take these se well, quite severe measures right now, that we're going to see ourselves um, flattening out and, and being able to care for people effectively um, in the coming weeks. Thank you. Next question, Mandy, go ahead, please. Um, hello, Dr. Dr. Henry. Um, some people believe that uh, zinc can even cure COVID-19, and some doctors said that this is not true. Could you make some uh, clarification about that? I'm sorry, what was the, you said some doctors believe that what will cure? Uh, 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 currently, some people believe that like zinc can cure COVID-19, and uh, some doctors said that this is not true, so uh, I would like to uh, ask you to make some clarification about that. So as far as we know right now, there is no cure for COVID-19. It's a virus that we do not have a treatment for and we do not have a method of preventing it when somebody's been exposed. We do know that there are things that we can do to keep ourselves healthy and being active, eating well, getting rest, something that I aspire to. Um, you know, those are the things that help our body's immune system stay active and vital so that we can fight off viruses like COVID-19. But at the moment, there is no cure. Thank you. Next, uh, Keith, go ahead, please. Keith Baldry? Yes. Uh, Dr. Henry, your comments about transit, um, which sound like good ideas, but are you suggesting you're recommending to TransLink and other transit bodies that they impose regulations limiting the number of people on, uh, on buses or uh, SkyTrain cars? Yes, that's what um, we're talking with and making clear sort of what does this mean to not have, uh, to have social distancing on these important essential services. So yes, um, I've been talking to them about the important things about enhanced cleaning, about having the ability for the operators to clean their hands, for them not to congregate together um, when they're having breaks, um, to reduce the number of office staff, to look at how we can stagger people in public transit. And of course right now, where many people are staying at home, um, transit is less crowded, so we're better able to do those sorts of measures. But those are important measures right now. Next questions uh, from the phone, Maria, Richard, and then Sarah. Maria, go ahead, please. Oh, hi there, uh, Dr. Henry. I had a question about uh, the daycares again. Um, hearing some real concerns from people uh, working in the child care sector, uh, concerns about not being able to find uh, proper or enough cleaning supplies for their centers, concerns about maintaining required ratios because some, in some cases staff members also have to self-isolate. Uh, and they're really questioning why in some cases they're not also following uh, what happens with uh, K-12 to uh, schools. Um, so I'm just wondering uh, if you could uh, reiterate again uh, why uh, daycare centers, in light of some of those uh, issues, uh, are uh, still being allowed to operate. And uh, also, um, if, if, uh, is there any other way, to a uh, different model that could be looked at to provide uh, essential workers with childcare, possibly without keeping all centers open? Yes, yeah, so uh, certainly we are not uh, keeping all centers open and that is not what's in place right now. There's no requirement for all centers to stay open and what we're looking at is that, uh, you know, I do believe child care is an essential service and particularly as we mentioned for our essential service workers. So the the ministry uh, MCFD um, and the other ministries that are involved, as you know, it's complex around child care, are putting in place these measures to ensure that we can have appropriate safe care for children um, that need it. And, you know, we, we didn't close schools. What we did was suspend classes so that children aren't in those environments. So we need to have plans where we can use appropriate facilities. So certainly some daycare facilities, it's very difficult to have that distancing, to have the measures in place and enhanced cleaning that you need. So uh, I'm, I know that they are looking actively with the, the child care community to um, look at what measures we can put in place, including looking at uh, you know what facilities would be appropriate for child care, um, looking at uh, people who are at higher risk of having severe illness, uh, workers not being involved 
Um, and so those are things that will be come clearer in the coming days. Um, I know there's a, there'll be a statement, I think, even later today with some more details around that. But that is what I have asked the sector to do, is to look at how we can best protect everybody in the sector, both the, the child care operators, the early childhood educators, as well as the families, and, and, uh, and but provide those necessary services for, for the essential service workers and health care workers. Thank you. Richard, go ahead. Again, Dr. Henry, and potentially for Minister Dix, on child care as well. Uh, will there be funding for child care to ensure that they can keep their spaces, you know, considering that they may have parents that aren't uh, going in now and not paying? Uh, will there be some financial support to ensure they can keep their leases going? And around people who use their grandparents as child care, is that still advised in terms of having young children with, in some cases, grandparents who are in their 70s or older taking care on a daily basis of children as uh, the parents continue to work? I know it's a very challenging question. The, the second one, um, it, it's, it, you know, if 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 grandparents are caring for children, then we want to be very careful that there's not intermingling, there's not play dates, that um, we try and, and protect those grandparents as much as possible. Um, that and we don't want grandparents looking after groups of children um, because we know. We know that children are still relatively spared with this. If they, uh, there was a recent uh, publication just today that came out of uh, the first 4,000 or so cases in the United States, and very few of them were young children, and uh, very few. I don't believe there. Well, there were no deaths, but there was only one child under the age of 19, a young person under the age of 19, that uh, even had a severe enough illness to be hospitalized. There was nobody in ICU. So we know that children are relatively spared from. The the, the disease, what we don't know is if they are effective transmitters of the disease, and that's where the challenge is. So if it's a family and they're looking after their own children, we need to be very careful about not having other children in that mix as well. Um, that might increase the risk and taking those other important measures to protect um, the elderly people, the older people in our communities. In terms of, of Funding, yes, those are certainly measures that we've been talking with the other ministries about, um, making sure people don't lose their spaces, making sure that the, the daycare operators are able to survive this so that they are available once we start um, ramping up society again when this settles down. And I don't know if you yeah. want to add to that. And just to say that um, you heard yesterday from, um, from Minister Carol James, from the Minister of Education, from the Premier. and. Uh, as you know, there will be a legislative session uh, next Monday. I'm, I'm uh, uh, on the list to be there, and, uh, uh, and some of these issues will be addressed uh, uh, because we are dealing with issues around supply and so on. So you'll be hearing from the ministers responsible and obviously from the Minister of Finance on all that, Richard. Thank you. Next question, Sarah. Sarah McDonald, go ahead, please. Dr. Henry, we have also been hearing concerns from healthcare professionals working specifically at the designated COVID hospitals, so VGH and Surrey Memorial, about the shortage of medical equipment like masks um, and the potential for the transmission of the virus among the healthcare professionals actually on the front line. Some of the healthcare workers we've spoken to want to see these designated COVID hospitals and senior care homes on lockdown, and by that they tell us they mean barring visitors with very few exceptions to prevent the spread of the virus. So could that happen? And further to that, we're now seeing major American cities on lockdown under shelter-in-place orders. Is this the direction that we are headed in major cities within this province? And if so, why not just do it now proactively? Essentially, we are doing very much that. What we're doing is uh, in shelter in place for, uh, for seniors um, who are most at risk. We have put in very um, strict restrictions in most uh, uh, long-term care and assisted living facilities, and I think that's incredibly important. Um, there's always challenges in those sectors, and we're looking at, at how, do we, how do we best protect them, um, how do we make sure that healthcare workers are things like assigned to one facility, and the complexities of our, our healthcare workforce right now makes these challenging, difficult questions. Um, 
I, I, I you know the the rationale for having specific facilities look after people with COVID-19 um, and be have dedicated staff for that have dedicated um, physical space and the equipment and everything that they need assigned is something that uh, we are in the process process of establishing and it's important to do that to protect the health care resources that provide that other health care for everybody else um, and to make sure that parts of the hospital that are not um, seeing uh, people with COVID-19 are completely separate um, both from a health care um, perspective, a healthcare worker perspective, but also a physical perspective. Um, so those things are um, starting. As you know, we have still quite small numbers in the uh, in hospital at this time, but you know the concern is, of course, that that will increase. And I know uh, Surrey Memorial has been a leader in uh, supporting um, other units in developing the protocols that they need and in the, making sure they know what to do. And they spent a lot of time in, um, as a provincial resource uh, for the biocontainment unit or the high threat pathogen unit, we call it, to make sure that we have that critical expertise of both nursing, um, ancillary healthcare worker staff, physicians who understand the intricacies of, of all of the things that we need to do in, in uh, the infection control spectrum in those settings. So um, I have a lot of confidence in <laughs> what they're doing, but it's, um, it's a challenge to bring everybody up to speed quite quickly. Next questions from Tom Fletcher, Ashley Vadwani, and Nicole Ord. Tom, go ahead, please. Uh, hi, Minister. You, you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned strategic testing. Uh, at the beginning, uh, most of the cases we were hearing about around, involved older adults, 60s and up. Um, now more people are being tested, quite a few more. Has the demographic changed on that? Yes, it has. And so uh, actually uh, the early testing showed a variety of age, age groups, mostly older people, um, but it was people who traveled. So initially most of the testing that we were doing was directed at people who were coming into the country from areas where we knew um, this was circulating and eventually areas where we actually didn't know this was circulating until they came in. The demographic now, and I'll be talking more about this in the coming days as we get a better picture around some of these things, but the demographic demographic now it reflects as well um, that we have quite a few healthcare workers who have been infected, particularly in the Lynn Valley care home. So they're mostly um, younger and, and female. So those are the things that we watch quite carefully in the epidemiologic um, picture that we're looking at. I will say though, it's quite heartening that even though some of the people uh, were quite old, we're over 70, over 80, over 90, um, and many of them have done quite well and are, are in recovery at home. So that is heartening for us. Thank you. Ashley, go ahead. Hi, this is for Dr. Bonnie Henry, I think. Um, and this might have been answered in uh, the days past, I'm sorry. Um, but we are getting word that some healthcare workers are being told that even if they had recently traveled, they don't need to self-isolate for the 14 days. Uh, I guess that is so they can um, work on the front lines and that, that um, self-isolation period is being waived for them. Uh, can you clarify if that's the case and how that is being determined? Right. So uh, the, uh, I think the way it was messaged, you know, as we as we said, we're learning as we go with this, and the way it was messaged is that they were exempt, but that is not correct. Everybody who comes in uh, from outside of Canada is required to self-isolate for 14 days. We know that that can, in some situations, create a, a challenge for staffing, and healthcare is one of them. Other essential services, like um, police services and a few others, and those have been identified through um, through Emergency Management BC, and we've given direction for those other essential services too. But in terms of healthcare workers, if somebody has a critical function in, in providing patient care and there's enough people absent from that critical function that it's going to compromise our ability to provide care in certain settings, then there has been an ability for uh, leadership within the operations of that 
organization, so it depends on what the workplace is. Um, so for in a hospital, for example, if there's a single surgeon who does a certain thing and that person is on isolation, um, there are protocols that they can come to work and the protocols would be they're in self-isolation when they're at home, they don't go out and about in the community. When they're at work, they take additional precautions like wearing a mask all the time, um, separating from other healthcare workers so they're not all sitting together having lunch together. Um, symptom checks on a regular basis and wearing the appropriate, um, taking the appropriate infection prevention and control measures with each and every patient that they see. So it is not just a blanket exemption, go into work, you're fine. It's very controlled and it's only where it's going to compromise patient care or essential services. And that, that goes for paramedics, it goes for all of the, the essential workers in that situation. Next question, Nicole. Go ahead, please. Hi, this is for uh, Dr. Henry. Uh, I'm in the BC Interior, and our listeners are telling us daily that Northern Health and Interior Health are too vague when it comes to releasing numbers of cases. They say it's causing rumors to spread around communities, and you know other provinces like Ontario are more specific. So why does BC not break down cases at least by region, say like Central Okanagan? or the Kootenays to at least provide some clarity but still ensure that people are uh, have privacy? Yeah, it, it's a very challenging thing. And it is, um, it's a partly privacy, but it's partly because we need everybody to be aware that the risk is not just in one place. It's not just them and over there. It's in your community too. And you need to be taking these measures now everywhere. In, in British Columbia and across Canada and, and quite frankly globally right now because this is being transmitted very rapidly and it, it uh, doesn't serve anybody to think that it's not um, it won't affect me and it's not in my community and it won't affect my family. We know people travel back from all over the place and we know that uh, we can't always tell everybody that has this disease. So um, the, the precautions that we're putting out are for everybody in every community across British Columbia right now so that we can stop the transmission everywhere in our communities here today. We have time for, to take a couple more questions over the phone. The next question from Srushti Gangdev. Srushti, go ahead, please. Hi, Dr. Henry. I'm hearing from a lot of people who are telling me they're concerned that their employers are still telling them to come into work physically, even if they're doing things like graphic design, things that can easily be done from home. And the consensus out there seems to be that this is still an option. Um, are you today instructing employers with non-essential employees to stay home and work from home? And if that isn't followed, would you be issuing an order to that effect? I'm not intending to issue an order at this point, but my uh, recommend my my expectation is that every employer will look at um, how they can reduce the interactions of their employees um, in the community and in their workplace settings. And the the social the social distancing, physical distancing requirements apply to um, all of those settings as well. So if I run a graphic design business and I have uh, 20 employees and a small enclosed space, then I need to find ways that they can um, uh, maintain an appropriate distance from each other and that may mean staggering when who's in the office, some people working from home at different times. There's options that people can use to reduce the, the crowding of people within a work environment and that protects your business and it protects your employees as well as your family and your community. So my expectation is that all companies will look at that. All employers will be looking at those requirements right now and ensuring that they're doing everything they can to protect their employees and their business and our communities. And the last question is from Denise Ryan, Vancouver Sun. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, uh, I'm just wondering what recommendations uh, you have for pregnant and postpartum women and if any special protocols have been issued uh, to delivery hospitals throughout the province, and if so, what are they? 
Yeah, so that is one of the areas that we follow very closely. There's been um, there's been some work internationally about understanding the transmission in uh, in pregnancy and whether it's transmitted vertically. We call it from the mum to the baby um, during during pregnancy. And uh, the short answer is yes. This is very much on the radar screen. We have a group of clinicians, including Dr. Deborah Money, who's a, a, a gynecologist obstetrician, who's one of the leading. Um, obstetricians in the, the country who's been on this from the beginning and there's a group of clin clinicians that are making sure that we have the best practices and the best information around treatments, around uh, experimental treatments and uh, how to clinically manage people. So um, people in pregnancy, particularly people in their third trimester who are at risk of this are priority for testing, for example, because they will be inevitably in hospital at some point in the, the near future. So those are things that we've put in place. Um, and I know uh, Women's Hospital has been working at this as well. Um, I don't have the specific details, but I know they, that this is something that has been um, really important and critical for them. Thank you all for participating. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.